Genesis 45, 25. <clears throat> Here is where you are. I'd stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through his voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. In order to have the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ, once we have seen the glory of the cross and the majesty of God in forgiving wretched sin, and sinners, seeing the love of God towards sinners and the hatred of God towards sin, as he spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all. We are then sent forth, and verse 25 of chapter 45 of Genesis expresses it. And they went up out of Egypt and came into the land of Canaan. That's our subject today. They came into the land of Canaan unto Jacob, their father, and told him exactly what Joseph said to tell him. In verse 13, And you shall tell my father of all my glory in Egypt and all that ye have seen, and ye shall haste and bring down my father hither. And told him, saying, Joseph is yet alive. He is governor over all the land of Egypt. And Jacob's heart fainted, for he believed them not. The strength of the unbelief will heighten the joy of the belief. And they told him, all the words of Joseph which he had said unto them and when he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him the spirit of Jacob their father revived and Israel said it is enough Joseph my son is yet alive I will go and see him before I die my what a glorious result of having to go back down into the land of Canaan. We said to go to the land of Canaan, you have to go out of Egypt. You have to understand that your sin is a sin against the sovereign. You have to understand that that sin has the sentence of death upon it. And then you see your sins confessed and therefore forgiven. Joseph tells them in verses 5 and 7 of chapter 45 not to grieve over their past sin. And we saw that uh, there is therefore now no condemnation to them who are in Christ Jesus. Jeremiah chapter 50 and verse number 20. Jeremiah 50 and verse 20. In those days and in that time, saith the Lord, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none. I do you like them apples. Isn't that good? If they seek for it, Jeremiah 50, 20, they're not going to be able to find it. The sins of Judah, and they shall not be found. Why? For I will pardon them whom I reserve. Ain't God good? Yes, Romans chapter 4, the last verse, and chapter 5, the first verse. Romans 4, 25 and 5, 1. Who, the Lord Jesus was delivered for our offenses. That's the forgiveness that we have. He went to the cross because of our offenses. And he was raised again for our justification. 
Did Jesus die? Yes. Do you have an interest in the atonement? You'll have to answer that for yourself. If you do, then him being delivered gave you forgiveness from your offenses. Did Jesus raise from the dead? Yes, he did. Do you have an interest in the resurrection? You have to answer that yourself. But if you do, Christ being raised says you are justified. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And so we, came, we come to see Joseph in an entirely different light. He is in chapter 45, verse 4, Genesis 45 and verse 4. And Joseph said unto his brothers, Come near me, I pray you. And they came near, and he said, I am Joseph, your brother, whom you sold into Egypt. They didn't recognize him. We come to know the Lord Jesus Christ in a different way now. And in verse 13, we've already read you. You recognizing my glory are now to go back to Canaan and tell others about it. So they see him in an entirely different light than ever they did before. He's not like the brother that came down there where they were keeping their sheep that they put into the pit. He's not like that Egyptian, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, He's not like that Egyptian that had their life in his hands that has troubled them during the first two years of the famine. He is different now. Come nigh unto me. I am your brother, Joseph. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15, we are told that we must leave the appearance and the physical imagination that we have of what Jesus of Nazareth looked like. We got to come on from that. Most of religion is about an image of Jesus that the artist back during the early days, during the Renaissance, all of that painted of him. And that's what we got in our mind. That won't do. You've got to come to a different image of God in your heart. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15, it makes a statement. He said that if he died for all, they should live, they that live should not henceforth live unto himself, but unto him which died for them and rose again. We judge that if one died for all, then we were all dead. So now he has died for you, then you owe him your life. He comes to the next statement and he said, Wherefore, henceforth, know we no man after the flesh. In meeting Christians on my pilgrim walk, I have become astounded at what my natural eye judges them to be. And then afterward, knowing them in the spirit, to see how wrong I was about a lot of different people. Some that you thought you could never be close to and that they wouldn't understand your walk with God, understand it far better than you think for they themselves have been walking with God. And some people that you think, well, this is going to be great. I'm going to really benefit from knowing this brother or sister. Turns out not to be great at all. And you can't judge after the flesh anymore. Because we were all dead in trespasses and sins and Jesus has made us alive in the spirit, now you've got to know them in the spirit and not after the natural birth. Henceforth know we no man after the flesh. And it goes this far. Yea, even though ye have known Christ after the flesh, yet now, and here's that word again, henceforth from this point on, know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creation or creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. 
So Christ himself is now different from ever that he was prior to his death, burial, and resurrection. Joseph now is different to them. They recognize who he is. They begin to see familiar traits of him. And I don't know but what the Holy Spirit distorted their view of him so that they could not perceive who he was until God chose to have him reveal himself to him. But now they begin to see this is Joseph, our brother, whereas he was this really rough speaking Egyptian that was really hard on us and after our lives. They come to know him in a far different light. Dear soul, you come to know the person of the Lord Jesus Christ by the revelation of God in your soul. You begin to work to make sure you get rid of all the religious images that the harlot church has put into your mind. First thing I did was get rid of a Bible with pictures in it. Next thing I had to do was realize that that man in those paintings at the upper room or in the, you know, the Last Supper and all that, that's just their interpretation of Jesus. And it came probably from the influence of the Roman Catholic Church that loves to look on things physical. But we are given one description of what Jesus is like in Hebrew. No, we ain't. Revelation chapter 1 and we see things that are symbolic. A sword for a tongue. Fire for eyes. White as cotton hair. Brass feet and so forth. And we come to understand that we don't know and understand our God by pictures and statues. But further than that, we don't know our God by imaginations that religion has put in our mind. Jesus Christ is not known by imagination. He's known by revelation. Amen. The Bible said casting down imagination and every thought that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. You've got a lifetime work, dear religionist. To get all of that junk out of your mind and come to worship him. How, Brother Kenny? We worship him in spirit and in truth. We make sure that our buildings have no pictures and statues. But that's not where we stick in our thumb and pull out a plum and say, oh, what a good boy am I. We got to get rid of that stuff in our head. I used to think when I would see the Smith Brothers Croft drop ad, and you must know how old I am, I'm dating myself to think about those guys. They had beards that run down to their knees. And, and you think, well, that's what God the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost look like. And then you come to think, well, the Father sitting on the throne, he's got a big beard, and Jesus standing beside him in sandals and a gown, and the Holy Spirit looks like Casper the Friendly Ghost. Throw all this in the trash can if you want. These are processes I went through. Maybe you didn't. But I'm trying to picture God, and that's my problem. Yeah. It should be by revelation. You come to know him by who he is and how he has conducted himself in your salvation. And he endears himself to you so that you come to understand that it's man that looks on the outward appearance but if God will help me, I will look upon his heart. And I will perceive and understand and know by the revelation of God. So they came to know Joseph in an entirely different light. In John chapter 6, in verse number 63, John 6 and verse 63, You think about this verse now. We've read it a hundred jillion times. But think about it. It is the spirit that maketh alive, that quickeneth. The flesh, read me the next two words. Now wait a minute. You say, 
I know he's talking about how I ought to be spiritual and not be fleshly. You just think about yourself. No. Come on now. What about the Lord Jesus? Henceforth know we him no more after the flesh. Did his flesh profit something? Well, it sure did. If it hadn't been for his body and his blood, I wouldn't have salvation. But he said compared to that, the spirit is that which quickens and giveth life. Your ascending upward in verse 62 is in the spiritual uh, contact with Christ and in contradiction to the flesh, sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. What if you applied verse 63 of John 6 to Jesus Christ? He's the one that's talking. What if he's saying that the spirit in him is far more important and life-enduring and, and beneficial than his flesh was? Well, you say, well, that changes everything because all we've ever done is dwell upon thorn prints, nail prints, you know, the spear, and what happened to his body. But don't you think Jesus suffered far more in the spirit of himself than he did in his flesh? How in the world could he accomplish the redemption of the church, the church throughout the world, and their forgiveness and cleansing and mercy forever in a matter of just a few hours if it wasn't something spiritual that he was doing on that cross? Amen. It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. Now, the words that I speak, that I speak, he is talking about himself. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. So we come to understand that we are trying to imagine, form, shape, fathom a spiritual God, a spiritual word, a spiritual redemption in a natural and a literal way. We need to cast down those imaginations and come to understand Jesus simply in the Holy Ghost. He shall take of mine and shall show it unto you. So I understand the physical things of the Lord Jesus. But dear soul, those things are of no value than any other physical man unless he is the Holy Spirit as well. So I should look upon him with a cast down imagination and get him out of the box of contained imagination wherein I keep him to be less than what he ever was. What are you preaching, preacher? I don't know. I don't know how to get it across to you. First Peter 3.18. First Peter 3.18. Now I'm going to let you finish this verse, so don't, you know, don't try to trick me and not turn here, because you've got to read. First Timothy 3.18. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the spirit, excuse me, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the spirit. How in the world can you kill God? Well, they killed his body. Well, you ain't a problem with that because he said, no man takes my life. I've received this from my father. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up. Well, what made you lay it down? When I cried out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When I became sin and I realized the father had separated himself from me, that I didn't want to live anymore. But then that was that spiritual man giving up the life of the physical. So he was put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit, 
by which spirit he went and preached unto those spirits in prison. And of course, Dr. Bottle Stopper always says, went down to hell and preached there. I think it's talking about the days of Noah when the Holy Spirit preached through Noah to the spirits, the lost people in Noah's day, and it didn't do any good. He preached 120 years to those spirits in prison, those people that were lost in Noah's day, and, and that's what it's talking about here. But it's talking about spiritual things, folks. We need to come to understand God in the Spirit and get Him out of our little picture and stature, Jesus. Look at Deut Deuteronomy. I can say that. Deuteronomy 33, verses 8 and 9. The book of Deuteronomy, chapter 33. And of Levi, he said, Let thy thru thruman and human, Urim, all right, Gary, you've got to read this, be with the ho thy holy one, whom thou didst prove at Massa, and with whom thou didst strive at the waters of Meribah. Talking about Levi now. Who said unto his father and to his mother, I have not seen him. Neither did he acknowledge his brethren, nor knew his own children, for they have observed thy word and kept thy covenant. Here is a priesthood who says, I don't recognize my own mother and daddy because I see that I am given to serve and worship God. You have the same thing in the New Testament when Jesus said, Who is my mother and my brothers and sisters but those that do the will of my Father? So we're supposed to come not to recognize physical mothers and daddies and brothers and sisters in lieu of recognizing the spiritual man, Jesus Christ, and seek unto him and seek for a renewed vision of him. It was a different look at Joseph than ever they had come to know before. Then in chapter 45 and verse 22 of Genesis, everyone left with a new garment. Everyone left with a new garment. Genesis 45 verse 22. To all of them, all of the brothers, he gave each man changes of raiment. But to Benjamin he gave 300 pieces of silver and five changes of raiment. So we understand, dear soul, that once you have come to see Joseph and understand his sovereign reign, whosoever call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, then you are sent back to serve like the man that was among the tombs. You're sent back to serve in, in what we're calling Canaan today, back where you were, go to thy house, he said. Go home to thy friends and tell them how great things the Lord hath done to you. But before he tells him to do that, in Mark 5, 15, they came to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legions sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. The man has not had any clothes on. He has not been able to be tamed, but here he is, and he's seeing the Lord Jesus Christ in his glory, and God has now got him clothed. This physical clothing represents the garment of righteousness that we see in Revelation chapter 19 and verse 8. I knew it was coming. I didn't know where it was. Revelation 19, 8. This man is physically clothed to show you that once you come to see Jesus, he doesn't send you back in those old garments into Canaan to be a representative and witness of him, but he sends you back in a different garment. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is... The righteousness of saints. 
You obtained righteousness and were dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne when God saved you. The church, was it Laodicea? We have, no, we have need of nothing. He said, you don't know that you're naked. You don't stand in the righteousness of God. You're standing in your own works. You think you're clothed because you are able to do so much with all the money that you have and with all the influence that you have. You're not even a spiritual church. He said you're naked and blind. You need to buy gold tried in the fire and, and salve to anoint your eyes and you need to come and get a garment. Who was it that the Lord threw out of the wedding? It was a man that did not have a wedding garment on. He was as much a man of the community like the rest of them. He stood there with the rest of them, but that was the problem. He stood there in arrogance, unclothed in the garment that the king provided for all the guests. Everybody that came got a different got a garment for the wedding. And this guy stands there. And dear soul, if we think we're going to stand in our works righteousness, we, we got trouble. God's going to throw us out. No, you're going to honor his son. This thing has got to be like God wants it to be. So he gets thrown out because he did not have a wedding garment. Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and a gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. There's a lot of people that hears the gospel that are affected in a lot of ways that, are, that is not unto salvation and they're not clothed in the righteousness of Christ. They try to come on in anyhow and God said, Nope. Can't get in unless you're dressed in his righteousness alone. Every one of them got a different garment when Joseph sent them back to Canaan. God has done that to every one of us. They, everyone, went back with a different garment on. I think in Esther chapter 4 that Mordecai got in trouble by coming in sackcloth to the king's gate and Esther sent him out a change of clothes and said, Uncle, you better put these clothes on because the king don't allow anybody to come in here with sackcloth on. And Mordecai said, I can't do it. My spirit's in sackcloth. From my body's got to be, I got to be dressed on the outside like I am on the inside. And you know the story. Brother Jamie brought it out this morning. There has been confession to me today by more than one of God's people in this very building that, quote, I am dissatisfied with my conduct before the Lord. I feel like I'm not reaching and making the mark. I feel like I ought to be doing things that I'm not doing, and I feel like I shouldn't, uh, uh, I should, uh, what did I just say? Doing things that I'm not doing. And, and, and I, I feel like I am doing things that I should not be doing. I said, you're in Romans 7. The things that I would do, I do not. The things that I would not do, that do I. So I find then a law, when I would do good, evil is present with me. You can have a garment of righteousness on, but still, dear soul, you've got trouble in the flesh and you're going to have to you're going to have to battle with it all the rest of your life. But listen, that garment that God put on you bespeaks of His righteousness imputed to you so that there may, time, may be times when you don't feel holy or even saved. But dear soul, the just shall not live by feeling but by Amen. faith. So you trust in God's righteousness. And yes, when you see the lack of holiness in myself, I go to God and talk to him about it because he said, be ye holy. Watch out now. And he set the bar so high, I can't make it without him. As I, the Lord thy God, am holy. Ooh. Now if he told me to be holy as somebody around here, I'd say, okay, I got that made. 
No. If you measure yourselves by yourselves, you do err, the apostle said. But what we got to understand that we have the righteousness of God imputed to us because Jesus had the unrighteousness of our sin imputed to him. It was really genuine, horrible, soul-damning sin that he got. It wasn't, it wasn't a reasonable facsimile thereof. It was really horrible sin. So you get really glorious righteousness. Not a reasonable facsimile thereof. And some of y'all cringe when I tell you that the righteousness of the Christian sitting here today is the same righteousness in the breast of Jesus Christ sitting at the right hand of the majesty on high. There ain't no other righteousness. God don't have no day-old bakery righteousness. There is no consignment shop or second store or whatever. You either get God's righteousness or you don't. So if you say, no, oh, I don't live up to it. Of course you don't. But dear soul, God doesn't see you in your daddy. He sees you in Christ. It's not your natural birth. It's your spiritual birth. And if you don't quit trying to get the caboose in front of the engine, what are you saying? The engine is faith. The caboose is feelings. It ain't got no engine in it. It just follows along behind. You may not feel, but dear soul, if you have faith, you are. You might as well come on and agree with this because I ain't going to quit harping on this because God won't leave me alone. He said, you're going to bring that church to worship or I'm going to throw you out. I said, okay, Lord. And you ain't going to come to worship uh, until you see what you've got in Christ. Yes, I know what you have in yourself. We all know that. But you got to come to admit that God, done a good, God has done a good thing and given you the perfect righteousness of God. Mm. You either got a wedding garment on or you're out. And there ain't but one kind of wedding garment. He has made him to be sin for us that we might be made the right. Come on now, say it together. That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. Now you're in trouble because you just said it out loud. And you said, I have the righteousness of God in Christ. And it's inside you. Now you go out of here poor mouth and talking about how terrible you are. You, you got to watch out because you're talking about God's young'un. How are you going to worship if you stay down there in that, in that mud puddle? Think about what you've got and what God's done in you. And it, it wasn't no half-baked thing, friend. It was, it was a real thing. And those who were brought out have a name change. We go down in the last part of this chapter and we see Jacob in verse 25 verse 26 Jacob's heart fainted verse 27 the spirit of Jacob their father revived Jacob 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 but it says he was Jacob because he didn't believe and his heart fainted and then in verse 28 after he saw two things, he was given two things. It was the word in verse 27, and they told him all the words. And when he saw the wagons, two point outline, the words and the wagons. That's what convinced this one down in Canaan. And he had a name change. The words, of course, you know, God spake the word to your heart and you believed unto righteousness. For faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. But what about the wagons? Well, read me what the wagons are for. When he saw the wagons which Joseph had sent to carry him. 
Ere since by faith I saw the stream Thy flowing wounds supply Redeeming love has been my theme Ere since by what I saw He saw the wagons That was to carry him Into the presence of Joseph The wagons represent faith For faith evidences things not seen By faith we understand Hebrews 11 and he that cometh to Joseph must believe that he is. is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. And this thing came out of Egypt. You ain't never seen nothing like this in Canaan. You don't have nothing like this in religion. This comes from God. This comes from outside of your ability to conjure it up. They didn't have all that many wheeled vehicles in Canaan. I hadn't remembered reading of any of them thus far. But not only were they wheeled vehicles that was, was scarce in Canaan if they existed at all, but they were Egyptian designed with Egyptian different designs on the outside of them. The way they were painted, the way they were made, the way they were configured. They came from some other place. For by grace are you saved through faith. And that, not, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. It come from a far country. It's the gift of God. Oh, my soul. You heard the word. You saw the wagons. What's the wagons going to do? Going to carry me to Joseph. Then you've got to believe Joseph is. That's faith. You've got to see something you have never seen before. That's faith. It evidences things not seen. And dear soul, I'm going to tell you something this wagon's brought. Joseph sent in these wagons enough provisions to get those 11 boys back home and to get the 11 boys and all their wives and kids and their daddies back to Egypt. I was listening to y'all when I was back there drying off after baptism, and y'all were singing a song, and it said something in it about God providing you with the provision that you needed. I forgot this. It was the second one y'all sang. I, I was going to remember it, but when you get my head near water, it washes all my thoughts out. But anyhow, you're not going to have a need in getting back to Canaan and on to God that God doesn't provide for you. In fact, the only reason you have a need is because God has a provision waiting on you to need it. Amen, bro. You got to be hungry to have the bread, and the bread's been ready for centuries. That's right. Amen. The lamb is slain from the foundation of the world. Was you there? No. no. Was Adam there? No. You mean to tell me that God had blood redemption already set up before Adam ever fell? Yes. yes amen. And you ain't going to have blessed hunger unless there's bread ready to feed you. Amen? amen. Sure. So the wagons are going to provide for you. Brother Kenny, can I put you on the spot? Have you got have, have, have you got anything in your heart where you're just really dissatisfied with God about it? Something God done that just really failed you and he hadn't measured up? Absolutely not. Not a one time has he. Ere since by faith I saw the stream thy flowing wounds supply. Redeeming love has been my theme. Bless God, I'm going to keep singing it till I die. You know why? Because there ain't nothing. But he ain't going to do no wrong. Faith is going to break. This is the victory that overcometh the world. Amen. Even our faith. 1 John 5, 4. The only way faith is going to dissolve is when love transcends it and brings to you that which faith and hope has reached out and believed in. And then when you get him, you ain't going to need faith and hope no more because he's going to be standing right there with you. Amen. Ain't God good? Faith will get you from, they got, it got them from 
Joseph's presence in Egypt all the way back to Canaan, got the one that God had reserved, got the one that God had elected, changed his name from Jacob to Israel, and brought him all the way back with all of his family, and ain't none of them hungry yet. Hmm. The Bible says that there's a number that no man can number in eternal glory. And I think, you know, that's a lot of folks been eating off of Jesus. And it sure is funny that about as soon as mama makes one of them good desserts, and you go back in there for a second, help him, them stinking kids that done got in there and eat every bit of it. And you ain't got nothing but a plant pan to wash. I mean, them darling youngers. I don't mean stinking kids. But I ain't never found an empty pan, Brother Kenny. I ain't never had to lick the bowl just to get a taste. I always get a spoon, man, give me all I want. Because there ain't no end to God. And He is the bread. Ain't God good to us? He heard the words and He saw the wagons. And that's what convinced Him. And He said, as Israel now, He goes from being Jacob the supplanter, the cheat, the liar, He goes back to being Israel. God has changed his name and that's what he's known as every time you see him spiritually he's Israel every time you see him physically it says Jacob you, you try it out alright let's see if we can't wrap this up in Genesis 46 and this is the best part of going back to Canaan in Genesis 46 Israel took his journey, not Jacob, with all that he had and came to Beer, that's the whale, means whale. Sheba means oath. And he came to the well of the oath and offered sacrifices unto the God of his father Isaac. And God spake unto who? Israel, Israel in the visions of the night. And he said... called him by his physical name to let him know, I know you ain't nothing, but you're going to be something in me. And he said, here am I. And listen to this. This will make a Presbyterian shout. And he said, I am God, the God of thy father. First of all, fear not to go down into Egypt, for I will there, not anywhere else, make of thee a great nation. But the best part is the next thing he says. I will go down with thee into Egypt. Poor little suffering saint. I, I pray for you. Bless your dear soul. Little old, sweet little old bird come up to me this morning grieved over being in the world and being involved with the world didn't know it's going to be like that and i feel for that precious little old bird out there flickering around and religion the angel of light try to make her feel like she's supposed to be more than what she is and 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 the devil you know as a roaring lion trying to devour her for not being what she ought to be and making her feel guilty and i said listen you are what you are by the grace of God. If God wants you better, you would be better, honey. You better believe it. You're exactly where you're supposed to be in your walk with God. Because two can't walk together, Amos 3.3, 3, except they... And if I'm in step with God... Devil, shut your mouth. I'm doing fine. Oh, yeah, I know I ain't what I ought to be, but I sure am more than what I used to be. And I ain't what I'm going to be one of these days. So you can fuss at me all you want, but I'm going to slap you in the head with Romans 8.1. There's no condemnation to them that are in Christ Jesus. And if God said, go to Canaan, and then God said, I will make the great nation of thee there, and God said, come on, I'm going with you then don't give me no trouble about me being in the world. I may be in the world, but I ain't of the world. I'm sick of this world. 
But I'm going to stay here as long as I'm supposed to for the glory of Almighty God. And I tell him a lot. I don't like being here. But I like being with you and I like being obedient. Now listen to what he says. I will go down with thee into Egypt. And I will also surely bring thee up again. Isn't that good? And by the way, when you close your eyes in death, instead of the undertaker closing your eyes for you, I'm going to let your precious Joseph close your eyes for you. Dear soul, that's all I can ask for. God go down into Canaan with me. And when I die, my heavenly Joseph says it's enough. And he closes my eyes. And the first thing I see when I open them in eternal glory is the face of my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Yeah. Ain't God good? Amen. Then I'm supposed to bring you verse 24b of chapter 45. Our time is gone. You know what it is. So he sent his brother away and they departed. And he said unto them, Dear soul, it's not like you don't have a word of instruction wherein God says, Here is the way, walk ye therein. He said, See that ye quarrel not by the way. See that ye fall not out by the way. Joseph is saying to them, Listen, one of the things that gets you boys in trouble is yourself. I'm going to tell you what, friend, I don't need the devil in the world to get me in trouble. I can get in trouble by myself. I can sit in my rocking chair in the living room and get in trouble. And not only will God go with you, but He'll give you instruction and say, watch out. Don't quarrel. Don't fall out, by the way. 